Welcome to everyone here, gathered here at Berkeley and to those tuning in online for our public forum, Grading the Teachers, Measures, Media, and Policies. I'm Judith Warren Little. I'm the dean here at the Graduate School of Education at Berkeley, and I'm pleased to have as our co-sponsors for this event Berkeley School of Journalism, the School of Law, and the Goldman School of Public Policy. As I'm sure you all know, the impetus for today's forum was the launching of the Los Angeles Times series, Grading the Teachers, which included the publication of the names and effectiveness ratings based on test score gains of 6,000 elementary grade teachers. The debates that followed that series have been far-reaching and vigorous, to say the least. They encompass technical issues regarding the measurement of teacher effectiveness, philosophical and ethical issues regarding teaching, learning, and the public good, questions regarding the role of the media in society, and the possibilities and limitations of public policy at the local and state level. This morning on NBC, President Obama weighed in on the question of teacher effectiveness, affirming that the single most important ingredient inside the classroom is the quality of the teacher, and the teachers must receive the training, support, and recognition likely to boost effectiveness. But he also challenged districts, schools, and unions, that is, teachers themselves, to get serious about identifying and removing teachers who should not be in the classroom. These are complicated and controversial matters. I think we all agree. Hence the scope of our forum, which invites a conversation about how we might measure effectiveness, what role the media plays, and the policy avenues we might pursue together. The crowd here on this Monday afternoon and the number of queries we have had from around the state and around the country, and I should say we have people uh, listening in online, watching in online from UCLA, other, other places in California and around the country, attest to the significance of today's topic. We regret that the timing of this event on a Monday afternoon means that the many teachers out there teaching cannot participate directly. Uh, but we're providing a link both to the uh, archived website and to a uh, feedback loop, a uh, comment space, that will be up after today. And we encourage you all to watch and to participate in that, uh, in that space. You'll find the brief bios of our distinguished panelists, both in the materials that were out on the table and online. Um, I'm not going to elaborate on those now because I'll use up a half an hour in doing so. Um, but you can refer to them and our moderator, Louis Freeberg, will briefly introduce the panel um, when each one starts. Um, those of you who have come in, I think, have, have seen Teresa. She's got index cards for you to write comments uh, as you listen to each panel. And there will be people collecting those cards and bringing them up so that we get a, a good sampling of the questions and issues that you're raising for our discussion. Um, our moderator for today's forum is Louis Friedberg, who's a senior reporter on focusing on education issues for California Watch, which is a nonprofit uh, investigative reporting group. And I think Steve down here will be monitoring the time so that we'll be proceeding at the proper pace. So, Louis, we're all yours. Good afternoon. I want to welcome you all to this uh, important discussion and also thank the Graduate School of Education and the other schools and uh, units at the University of California, Berkeley for sponsoring this event. As you know, this is a very controversial local, state, and national issue. And uh, the LA Times series has given us an opportunity to look at this issue in uh, more detail than I think we would have done if uh, the series that the LA Times did had not jump-started the discussion which has been going on for many years and which many of the people uh, who you'll be hearing from have been looking at over the last several years. Uh, I think we need to acknowledge up front that there are different sides to this issue and I'm looking forward, as I know we all are, to an informed and rational discussion. And I know, you know, up front that we won't have time to go into as many of the complexities of this issue as we'd like or as much detail as we, as we like, but hopefully this will be a good starting point uh, for discussion. Just to give you a sense of the lay of the land, the first uh, panel will focus on the methodological issues raised by uh, the value added methodology and the Times uh, series. The second will look at the media aspects of this controversy 
and the final panel will look at some of the policy implications of uh, the first two panels. Um, and we have passed out cards for uh, those of you who want to pose questions to the panels, and we really encourage you to do so. Uh, I just wanted to first get a sense of you know, who is in the audience. I know there are lots of people uh, out there uh, in cyberspace that we can't poll. But uh, how many of you are K-12 teachers or work in schools? Okay, great. Well, we really thank you for being here and uh, look forward to getting your questions. Um, journalists. Okay, good representation. Uh, higher education uh, or research. Okay, great. Uh, parents. Okay, I, I'm sure some of you fit into several of those categories. <laughs> um, great. Uh, and school leaders. School leaders. Is that... Great. Okay, listen, this is a terrific cross-section of people, um, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and just to set the stage, I'm sure, uh, and while this is not intended to be a discussion of the LA Times series, I know this is what has prompted this discussion, so uh, we thought, um, let me ask you, how many of you read the LA Times series? Okay, not everybody. Good, so I'm glad we, uh, we are doing this. Uh, and really, uh, this is just to give you a visual sense of, um, of the oh, we lost the uh, okay so the LA Times has done a series of stories um, in a very short period of time and uh, this was this, uh, this the series they did on uh, the most successful teacher, effective teachers under the LA Times is evaluation system. Um, the Times explains how they did this. Uh, you can all go onto the Times uh, website and look at it in great detail. Um, several in-depth articles on schools. Uh, one of, the, one of the, uh, the articles looked at the most effective schools. And this is a most effective school just to give you an idea of what it looks like on the LA Times website. And uh, you'll see the chart, most effective. And then it does list the teachers, the names of the teachers, according to, um, goes from most effective to more effective, less effective, and least effective. Uh, there's also an average category that is missing. So I'll just go to the one, we'll just go to the middle, just so you can get an idea. So we know what we're all... Um, so this would be one teacher. Um, overall value added effectiveness, and then it breaks it down by math and English. And uh, this really doesn't <coughs> do justice to... The, the magnitude of, of the project at the time is, is undertaken by thought just to give people an idea of at least what it looks like on the website. So, with that, let me take my moderator's post over here. And introduce the first panel. Uh, first, Mark. Mark, you can go up and take your spot. <laughs> Uh, Mark Wilson is a professor at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Education. He is a psychometrician. His interests focus on measurement and applied statistics. And the reason he's here is that he was a member of the testing and assessment panel of the National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences that uh, prepared a report on value-added uh, methodology and that made recommendations to the Obama administration. Um, this panel, by the way, will be more, they are going to present in some depth their uh, thoughts on value-added um, uh, methodology. Uh, next, Sophia Rab Hesketh is a professor at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Education. She is an applied statistician who conducts methodological, methodological research in multi-level modeling and latent variable modeling. Not sure what that is, but maybe she'll <laughs> illuminate us on, in her presentation. 
Eric Hanusek is the Paul and Jean Hanna Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He's pioneering analysis measuring teacher quality through student achievement forms the basis for current research into the value-added uh, methodology of uh, looking at teachers and school effectiveness. So uh, let me turn it over now to Mark Wilson. I'm going to be talking uh, mainly about the uh, getting value out of value added report that came out of the NRC earlier this year. Um, I should mention it's a workshop report. That means it, it wasn't the product of a committee getting together and deciding what they thought was uh, the consensus, but uh, bringing together a group of people in a workshop and then representing what happened in that workshop um, with the idea that that workshop would represent the latest and most expert information. There was a stack of these out the front there. I know there's not enough for everyone, but I think some of you have this, so you can look at that uh, as you go through. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the report. I'm going to concentrate on the measurement issues that uh, were reported in that. Uh, my colleague, Sophia Roehesketh, is going to talk about the modelling uh, and analysis issues. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, what the report said about using value-added modelling to evaluate teachers as well, and then just a quick conclusion. Uh, if you uh, didn't manage to get a copy uh, today, you can get it from uh, download from the National Academies Press web, uh, website. You can download it as a PDF, uh, it's for free, or you can have it sent to you. Um, and perhaps if you want to look in more detail, you can actually get the papers that were given at the workshop at this second website here. Now, you don't have to copy it down. These slides are going to be available on the website associated with this afterwards, so you'll be able to get them off there. I just want you to know that they're, they're available. Um, just a few minutes to say the breadth and depth of the committee. This is the group of people who were the steering committee, the ones who put it together. Um, they cover a wide range of educational researchers and uh, policy researchers. And then the, res the workshop presenters themselves came from a, a variety of backgrounds, um, including uh, economists of education, educational statistics, from health and medicine, we were looking broad, broadly uh, outside of education at what people did there. The measurement area where I come from, international assessment, and also program evaluation. Um, there were actually four parts to the workshop. I'm just going to talk about mainly the measurement issues that had to do with that, give you some background on that, and then talk a little bit about the consequences. But if you do want to get the full details, then you should look at the, at the report itself. So, my topic, measurement issues. So first of all, um, we have to realise that the value-added measures of the teachers are going to be based on student test scores. And so we have to be sure that we're happy with those student test scores, that they do represent what we've asked the teachers to teach. Now, in fact, there are some very significant problems with that. Just taking as an example the California standard tests, uh, if you look into what the goals are, what the standards are that are supposed to be testing, you'll find there are some significant gaps between what the standards are, and what is actually measured in the test. I was on a panel that actually put this together for the high school exit exam, so I know it in some detail. Um, but for instance, one of, the, one of the examples of that is in math, in the problem solving area, there's a standard that says, and I'm going to quote it here, determine when and how to split a problem into separate parts. Now that sounds like a fairly small thing, but actually if you don't measure that, you're not measuring those more complicated problems that are in fact important especially in applied mathematics. They're not measured at all in the test. So that important standard that has been set, told is, and told to teachers is important is not there at all. Another one in the area of writing, for instance, is students write clear, coherent and focused essays. And that's measured by multiple choice items. <laughs> I, I will say no more about that. <laughs> So here's a, a quote from uh, one of my colleagues, Dale Ballou, uh, uh, an education economist at Vanderbilt. If tests do not cover enough of what teachers actually teach, and he points out that's a common complaint, the most sophisticated statistical analysis in the world still will not yield good estimates of value added unless it is appropriate to attach zero weight to learning that is not covered by the test. So there's a significant issue here in what is on those tests. Um, so it was, in addition, there's been some nice work done by Lockwood and, and Associates um, where they sort of set up a test of, well, does it make much difference if you use a different test? 
So they took one of the maths tests and they got the data that went with it from, from the state. And they said, well, let's try one, sort of, uh, one subset of the maths items and compare it to the results we would get from another set. And then they did a series of value-added analyses, quite a few different ones, just to see if it was robust. And what they found was that, yes, it did make a lot of difference. There was very low correlation between the two sets of results from the different uh, math subtests that were used. So it, it really does make a difference what results you get depend on what you measure. And that's really the first and the big one we need to worry about, I think. There are other issues involved in uh, measurement. One of those is called measurement error. In some sense, uh, the whole science of measurement is about reducing that error. But there's a lot of things that can happen in between when we set the test and when it actually happens and we get the results. There are students who have bad luck. You know, they're sick that day or that whole week. There are item format effects. There are issues to do with re representing things with multiple choice versus open-ended. There are pluses and negatives for both of those, by the way. I'm not all against multiple choice, but in fact, for some things, we probably would prefer open-ended. Uh, there can be different testing conditions depending on where you are. You know, you've been in noisy places, and if someone happens to have a noisy test room, well, that's a big problem. In open-ended items, there can be different raters, and that can make a big difference too. Although, of course, we try and control these things, but these issues need to be taken into account. It's very important to understand that the stability of teacher effects is affected by this. Um, one, th one thing that affects that, and, and Sophia will talk some more about this, is the number of students per teacher. If that gets too small, of course, we don't have much information to be worried to, to find out about how the teacher is varying over time. Um, but in fact, what you can have is that the measurement itself can also have variations over time. All those measurement effects can add up in one direction at one time and in another and another. So you get this confounding of the measurement error with the actual stability of the teacher. And uh, again, Ballou did a, a study of that and he found, and here's a, a quote from him, nearly a quarter of those that the teachers he's talking about who were in the top quartile in 1998 dropped to below the median the following year. So this is the sort of stability or instability that we're seeing in the results that we get. A third issue that's essential to any sort of regression analysis is that we need to believe that we have an interval scale. So what's an interval scale? Um, that is that equal size differences at all points on the scale represent the same differences in performance. The things you'll find that people are interpreting, and Sophia will give you some examples of these, the coefficients really rest, their interpretation rests on this idea. And in fact, it's something that might not be true. An example, just a sort of a, an everyday example, would be to think about temperature. Now, scientists have built temperature scales. We believe they are interval. But the sort of things we're talking about are psychological constructs. Something more similar to that that you might consider would be comfortableness. Now, as the temperature goes from, you know, 32 degrees, which is pretty cold, of course, up through to maybe 60 degrees, our comfortableness will not be a linear effect of that change in temperature. As it gets closer in towards what we're like, we'll probably be fairly reasonably smooth. But as it gets very hot, we start to get uncomfortable, and more so as it gets hotter in equal intervals. So the sort of things we're building when we're building measurements are not obvious physical characteristics that we can easily tell have this important interval scale. They are things that we have to make sure have that interval scale. Some of the things can affect them are what are called floor and ceiling effects, for instance. A floor effect would be where the items were not easy enough, they were, they were too hard to pick up the kids down the bottom, and they all bunch up at the bottom. A ceiling effect would be the opposite. That is, the, kids were, the items were not hard enough so the students would bunch up at the top of the scale and you wouldn't be able to tell the differences amongst the, the more able students. There can be curriculum differences that introduce this. Uh, there can be scaling problems. Technical things can happen. There was a quite famous one in California called the ninth grade effect where the testing company that was been making tests at the time, Harcourt Educational Measurement, had misscaled, it turned out, the grade nine math tests. And no one knew. And uh, we had kids all over the state doing summer courses in math because someone had made a scaling error. They shouldn't really have been doing it. I'm hope, I hope it was good for them anyway. You know, I mean, well, but anyway, these things happen. Uh, there can be many reasons why these interval scale assumptions aren't really working. And those coefficients that are also important, as you will see when we get to the equations, really don't mean what we hope they mean. 
There's a, a somewhat more technical issue, a little bit beyond that, if you want to actually go from grade to grade. Uh, the tests that we use in California, for instance, are really built one for grade three, one for grade four, one for grade five, and they measure within those grades. But often we want to see how we go across that. Now, in fact, in order to compare properly, easily, I should say, um, we would like to be able to use something like gain scores. And you need to be able to make the assumption that the units are equivalent from one grade to the next. So I use the point there sort of... They could be like inches in grade four and centimetres in grade five. We don't know that unless we do some extra work to find it out. And that can be a little bit extra to, carry, to figure out. People make a lot of this. I actually think that if you get interval scale, it's not too hard to go up to making those intervals be the same. But, um, but many people say it's a great, uh, a great problem. You have to be careful about this because if you don't look into the details of the equations, you probably think that gain scores are, are what are being analysed here. You might think people simply look at uh, the, the difference from one year to the next. Um, and, and that is, in fact, a, a sort of an obvious way to think about this. Turns out that it isn't always done that way. And again, Sophia will explain a little, in some more detail how we use a prediction model to get around that. And so sometimes if you use a prediction model, you don't need this topic of vertical linking. Um, but I do want to mention it for completeness so everyone's aware of it. The final issue I want to talk about is uh, what the committee called models of learning. Um, and uh, I have a quote here from Doug Wilms, who, who really, uh, I think, helped the committee see this clearly. He said, added value is about student learning. Therefore, any discussion of added value needs to begin with some model of what learning entails. And its estimation requires an explicit model of learning. So we have to know what we're going to do with this. We have to, it has to be more than just numbers. It has to be something we can work with. Uh, and he gave an example uh, where he thought that there was a very important point in reading where someone went from learning to read, that is mastering the mechanics, to reading to learn. That is, now you've got them, now we want to do something with them. We want to concentrate on comprehension, not just mechanics. So he saw this as sort of a sweet spot where we should be focusing very greatly in any, any reading test. It's not, they're not just numbers, uh, was his point. And we, need, we just sort of need theories of that. So we need to do, know what is being added what is being added in the added value? Uh, I do want to report that there is some, I think, some, some progress in that. There's a, uh, a, a, a new understanding of thinking about how we build curriculum called learning progressions that people are trying to develop. Now, I think it's a long way to go, but we are understanding, I think, better how students actually <laughs> develop. It's not just a matter of knowing what an expert should know. You have to know how the different steps that students might go through to get to that expertise. Mark is the official timekeeper. Two, Two minutes? <laughs> Great, okay. Um, well, uh, then I will uh, very quickly go on. I just mentioned some of the, the final things that uh, the committee felt. They thought, the committee thought that VAM might be useful for lower stakes purposes, that we might be able to put them together and build up ways to improve uh, teachers' practice by looking at the best and the worst. Um, they thought they might be good being combined with other indicators to come up with consistent results. And that if, in fact, we watched those results over time and learnt about them, we might be able to, to value them better. I would finally just return to the, the best advice about measurement, which comes from a document called The Standards, and it's the Standards for Educational Psychological Measurement. And that one big piece of advice is don't use just a single criterion. And I will point out that if you publish just one criterion in, say, the LA Times, you're forcing everyone to use a single criterion. And that is not such a good idea. So thank you. Just uh, let me introduce Sophie Rob Hesketh, who's a professor of UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Education and an applied statistician. Is it on? Yes. OK. So I'm, I'm going to comment on the modeling perspectives um, regarding this val der derivation of value added for teachers. And my remarks will be general, but occasionally I will refer to Richard Budden's paper that was the basis for the value-added scores published by the LA Times on the website, as you saw. Um, so I'm going to ignore the measurement issues raised by Mark and pretend that the desired outcome 
is measured perfectly by the test score without any error. <laughs> because just to simplify my, my, my talk. Um, so suppose teacher A students tend to have above average gains in test scores, whereas teacher B students tend to have below average gains in test scores. Is this observation evidence that teacher A has a greater beneficial effect on student outcomes, student learning, than teacher B? Well, the problem is that the difference in average student gains um, between the teacher could be due, at least in part, to systematic differences in the kinds of students the teachers teach, the kinds of curricula and materials the teachers are required to employ, as well as the general school and class environments that they teach in. And such systematic differences can occur because teachers and students are not randomly assigned to schools and classes. And this is well summarized by this old adage that association does not imply causation. And sport fans actually already know this. So in praising the excellence of their football coach, uh, a sport fan might say, not only would coach X beat your guys with his guys, but he'd also beat his, guys, his own guys if he was coaching your guys. <laughs> so this is kind of formalized in modern approaches to causal inference, where we define a so-called potential outcome or counterfactual outcome, which is what we would observe, let's say the Tesco we would observe for a student, um, if that student were subjected to each of the, of the treatments, to each of the teachers. So this would be then for a given student, all the teachers in the LA Unified School District. For each one of them, that student has a potential outcome. And then the causal effect is defined as, for a given student, the causal effect is defined as the difference between the outcome achieved by teacher A and the outcome achieved by teacher B for the same student. So you could also say what we're really asking is, would this group of students have better outcomes if taught by teacher A than if taught by teacher B? The same group of students. But the fundamental problem of causal inference is that for a given student or, or a classroom, we can only observe the potential outcome for one teacher. So in the absence of the ideal world, uh, we resort to regression modeling, typically. And these value-added models are actually regression models. And these models attempt to estimate the difference in average gains between two different groups of students taught by teachers A and B, holding constant or controlling for certain variables that we can call control variables. So for instance, if teacher B, who had the lower gains on average, um, has a greater proportion of English language learners, ELL students, than teacher A, then if we control for ELL, the regression model would adjust teacher B's average up and teacher A's average down to account for that difference in the percentage of ELL students in an attempt to estimate the difference in gains that we would find if we could compare like with, like, uh, with regard to ELL. So if both teachers were teaching the same proportion of ELL students. Now, this sounds a little bit too good to be true, that we can do this with a model. Um, and the reason for that is that it is too good to be true. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, these models require assumptions that not all of which can necessarily be assessed or tested. And so um, to kind of focus the ideas, I thought it was, would be useful to write down a kind of very generic type of model that you might assume. Um, for, so for, for the outcome Y for students, so that could be the gain in, a, in some test. Um, in a given class in school, taught by a given teacher, we, we assume that, there is, that this Y is kind of caused by the, the sum of these factors. So we have the effects of um, student characteristics. That's the student's own characteristics um, including their previous achievement, like a previous test score from the, from the year before, or it could be their ELL status, their gender, um, their parents' income, or their parents' education. For instance, highly educated parents may spend more time um, going over the schoolwork with their children and thus help them to achieve greater gains than less educated students. Um, and, in, and then we have school context, so that's school context or composition. So that's the effect of the sort of neighborhood that the school is in, um, as well as the kind of demographic composition of the school. So you may have a, a high proportion of schools, uh, of, of parents who have a high school degree, or a low proportion. And apparently in LA Unified School District, um, this, the percentage of parents with high school 
varies between 50% and 84% when we go from the low API, lowest API quartile schools to the highest API quartile schools. So there is, there, there is great variation. And the sorts of peers that you're surrounded in can affect your learning in a school. School practice is the effects of, of school administrators, um, administrative leadership, and the use of resources, and so on. Um, classroom context is the sorts of peers you're surrounded in in the class, which could include something like percentage English language learners, but also, um, you know, are there many disruptive students, possibly school clowns, um, or, you know, what's the average level of motivation among the students in the class? And, the, and your, the nature of your classmates can profoundly affect your learning. And then we have the, the T, that's the teacher value added that we are actually interested in. So what do we want this teacher value added for? We want it for accountability. We want it to reward, for rewarding or, or punishing, in a way, for merit-based pay, very often is, is proposed. So that means we need to control for or remove factors that are outside the teacher's control. And secondly, we want, to make the, we want to make these comparisons across schools. So the kind of things we have to control for include school level factors such as school co uh, composition and context and school practice. Um, so returning to this model then, the model, all these things are additive, all these things are being added up, especially the teacher value added here at the end. So this model assumes that there are no interactions. The two, uh, given teacher, um, adds the same value regardless of the kinds of children, the kinds of schools, etc. Um, if in reality um, some teachers can work better or more effective with certain kinds of students, then we would have a different value added, potential value added, theoretical value added score for a given teacher for several types of students. And then we could not, we would not be able to make comparisons of teachers across different settings, you know, where the, where the types of students are considerably different. Now, there are two main approaches to this value-added modeling, fixed effects for teachers and random effects for teachers. A general problem with all these approaches is that the variables that we need to capture in order to control for the things that are outside the teacher's control um, are imperfectly measured or, or not even available. So, for instance, in Richard Budden's analysis, the student background variables that he was able to control for included English language learner, gender, um, whether they entered the school district after kindergarten, was there something else? But anyway, it didn't include parents' education, it didn't include parents' income. So those, I don't know if those variables were not available. Um, if you use fixed effects for teachers, that means, for those of you who are familiar with regression, that we're basically using a dummy variable for each teacher and then interpreting the coefficients of those dummy variables as value-added scores. Um, in this approach, though, the problem is that um, we cannot actually control for any variables, for any characteristics of schools, etc., that are constant when teachers are held constant. So the value-added score automatically contains the effects of school composition, school practice, and, and classroom composition. And I think I'm a little out of time. I'm slower than I thought, so I'll skip this one. <laughs> um, there are problems with the random effects approach as well. Um, in Richard Budden's analysis, um, he, then, he actually used a fixed effects approach, and he found that the standard deviation of the teacher value added scores in math was 0.28. That's the kind of effect size. It means that a typical teacher may add um, 0.28 of a standard deviation. So this is in, in student standard deviation units. 0.28 of a standard deviation of value. And another teacher, you know, they, so they may differ in how much value they add by this amount quite often. Um, he did the same analysis with school value added, this time using school dummies instead of teacher dummies, and he found that the standard deviation for the school value added scores was 0.08. And my point is that the school value added is not negligible compared with the teacher value added, and it is actually contained in the teacher value added score, because school factors had, have not been controlled in this analysis. So I've, mo I've mostly focused on discussing biases in the, in the modeling due to assuming no interactions, due to inadequate and incorrect removal of effects of factors that are outside the teacher's control. Um, I also want to briefly mention that precision is a big issue, that Mark, Mark has already alluded to that. And I can't use the mouse? Oh, okay, I can. Um, so often, so this is a plot of the value added scores. Um, so a given point is a, is a teacher, the vertical position is the value added score. 
and the horizontal position is the rank of that teacher according to that value added score. So you can see that the value added increases as we go along. Um, but in addition to a point, we also have an interval. Um, and the interval re basically represents the fact that we cannot pin down the value added very precisely. So for this teacher, the value added might be anywhere. The true value added might be anywhere in that interval. Our best estimate is here, but the true value added could be anywhere. So for instance, the teacher who was up here, he, he could have been as low as that. So that's teacher A, the one with the good outcomes. And teacher B could have been down here, in which case um, teacher A, who is in the 90th percentile, would actually has a lower value added score than teacher B, who was in the 56th percentile. So that's the sort of magnitude of imprecision that is often associated with these uh, value added scores. And the imprecision is due to the fact that we're taking an average of a small number of students in order to estimate the value added score. And the LA Times is actually quite good about this because they require a minimum of 60 students per teacher, but even that is still a small number. Um, another issue is that even the true value added scores um, can, can move around. Um, and then model uncertainty. So there are many different ways of setting up these models, and if you put many researchers into one room to analyze the same data, you would come up with a wide range of different value added scores for, for teachers. So that's kind of model uncertainty. And so my solution to all these problems is do not use teacher value added for high stakes decisions. <laughs> um, and, and I also think do not use them for naming and shaming. At the very least, and, and if you absolutely had to, but maybe I shouldn't even allow for this, but if, if absolutely this cannot be prevented, then the, these value added scores should be presented with a margin of error, saying something like 50 plus minus 25, to express uncertainty, <laughs> to, pre to express uncertainty, including the uncertainty due to not knowing whether you have the right model. You can take that into account as well. Okay, so, thank you. Now, Eric Hanischek from the Hoover Institution at Stanford will add his value to that discussion. Well, my, my job is to listen to what they say and then give some comments on it. And um, I think part of my discussion begins first with a preview of the last panel today. What we do know with certainty notwithstanding the list of possible biases in these, is that there are huge differences among teachers. And these teachers make a difference, which teacher you get. Each of the parents in here, of which you are a large number, recognizes that when you take your child to school, and you're not indifferent among the potential teachers uh, that, that your child can get. Um, it adds up to a big amount. I'm an economist. And from the economist's perspective, it amounts to a big amount both for individual earnings, depending on what teacher you got and the subsequent success you have, and it matters for nations and growth rates. So that our, there's a lot of discussion about the competitiveness of our economy today. The real, uh, one of the real long-term determinants of competitiveness is the quality of the workforce and the labor force and what people know and that's been pretty well documented now, um, that comes down to these, albeit imperfect, test scores as a measure of the uh, quality of the labor force. So I would just want to preview the later discussion. The reason why um, I think that the LA Times did a real service to everybody in this is that everybody on all sides comes out and first stipulates, of course we know there are differences among teachers. It's just we don't want to use this evaluation approach. We want to use some other evaluation approach. But the point is that it, no other evaluation approach is being used. And just asserting that we don't like this one, let's do something else, doesn't in fact move us at all. This problem, the use of value added does in fact have a number of problems. Um, 
Sophia talked about uh, the assumption behind many of these uh, value-added models is that they're linear effects of different things. And she had a nice linear equation. But what I assert is that the previous discussions are, in fact, linear discussions of what's going on. If you can get a long enough list of potential errors, then it must be a big, serious problem. Uh, the reality is that a number of these issues have been looked at. Some of them are more serious than others. Some of them make a big difference. And some of them can be corrected. And just having a long list sort of leads you down the path to believe that, in fact, um, this has got to be just totally useless, uh, where, in fact, I don't think that's the answer. As we'll discuss uh, at the end of the day, nobody that I know of thinks that value-added scores should be used as a sole measure of teacher effectiveness. In fact, it can't be. Large numbers of teachers aren't assessed, or their students aren't assessed in, uh, in the subjects that they're teaching. They can't be used in this value added and so forth. Almost everybody believes that even if you do have value added measures, that those are not complete pictures of the effectiveness or value of uh, having, uh, of the particular teacher and would want to include other evaluations. A good example is the, the publicity that um, uh, Jason's article in the LA Times was a little bit overshadowed by the fact that Michelle Ree stepped into Washington, D.C. and made some decisions that were labeled as taking value added and firing people on the basis of these uh, equations, which is, of course, not the case. That is not what was done. The, uh, for, the stu for the teachers for whom you could measure value added, value added was one component along with a very elaborate and sophisticated evaluation system, subjective evaluation system by, in fact, school leaders. So that value added scores were half of the weights if you had them and the other was this other sophisticated thing from the New Teachers Project. Um, so let me go down the, the list of things here we have. Um, I don't have quite the applause lines. I know that. Um, uh, uh, the, the natural applause line is to say, we should never have high stakes tests. But in fact, schools are high stakes institutions. It matters a lot which teacher you have. In the long run outcomes for any individual, it makes a big difference. That's a high stakes decision. It's not a high stakes decision for the teacher. It's a high stakes decision for the kids. Um, now let's, um, let's talk about the uh, key elements. Um, and I'm going to play largely off Mark's presentation. Um, quality of the test. Uh, this is a huge issue. There's no doubt about it. And I think that we have some very bad tests. We have some very bad tests outside of, that are worse than California's. He sort of made fun of the California test in a variety of ways. But in fact, there are other states that, that are much worse than California. Um, can we move to a better testing? I think it's obvious that we could. Um, move to better testing. There is not a lot of incentive right now to do that. Uh, the testing companies don't have much incentive to move to, to much better testing, as far as I can tell. Uh, but maybe they will. This is something that has to be taken seriously. Um, I, I just offer as an aside. One way to, there are ways to fix some of these things. And so if we talk about the quality of test, one way to do that, in my mind, is to um, emulate uh, what the FAA does for testing pilots. Pilots have a written test and an in a important also practical test, like can you land. But they have a written test that uh, determines whether you can go further. On that written test, all 756 questions are known beforehand. They're public knowledge. 
and you go in and take a random sample, sample of 50 questions. Now, by making the test questions public knowledge, you open up the comments of whether it does cover the curriculum, whether the tests are, uh, whether the questions are ambiguous and wrong, as we found on some of our other tests, like even the MAP, which is supposedly the gold standard. Um, and you, in fact, encourage teachers to teach to the test, which I happen to think is probably a pretty good idea if you have, in fact, tests that cover the breadth and depth of knowledge that you want. Measurement errors. Tests always have measurement errors. They have the dog barking outside the window, which is now such a cliche in this business, that leads to some kids not performing as well as they should on a given test, or, or other days they eat the pizza before the test and they get pumped up and they test better than they, their knowledge, or whatever, lucky. This does filter through to estimating value added for teachers. Um, there are also ways to take care of it. For example, as the LA Times did, insisting that you have some minimum number of students. It turns out that from the analyses that have been done in the past, that 60 students actually brings down measurement error significantly. There's a big measurement error if you only have six or seven students for the particular students or the particular test. There is not such a big e measurement error when you get to 60. The um, interval scales, it's a big deal in some sense and not in others because there are modeling ways to, in fact, address those questions and deal with them that were not mentioned. If you just ignore them, it, it would be silly. Um, where am I left to? Um, I think we should pretty much open up the, to general discussion, but let me just say that listing the potential problems uh, is not the same as having an effective evaluation system because we have no alternative right now. I assert that value-added modeling gives useful information, albeit with error and albeit information that must be handled carefully but it's information that we would not want to pass up. It's information that we have not used in the past um, at all. One final thing is you can compare value-added modeling um, to other uh, evaluations, say by principles. And what you find is that principles are not really good at lining up everybody in the room. Um, I went to a school, actually, where there was an effort to line up everybody in my graduating class precisely uh, and put everybody in a single line. But that's not really what we want to do. There is no reason to think about doing that. What we really want to do is to distinguish the very good and the very bad teachers and recognize that there's a huge amount of uncertainty in the middle of this distribution. Let me see if I can actually get back. I'm, Oh. Uh, escape? Where did, where did escape? the picture? No, I want your picture. Oh, you want my picture? I yes. want your picture. <laughs> so what you want to do is distinguish not everybody in the middle and recognize that there's a lot of overlap. What you want to do is distinguish between the people at the bottom, the small number, I think, that are actually harming kids, and the small number at the top that are exceptional and that are going to change the growth patterns of kids, and then there's a broad middle range, which is good by all of our measures. Um, I'll talk about this later in the policy section, but if we could just, in fact, change our system to ensure that teachers aren't taught by the very bottom, that they get an average teacher instead of the very bottom, we would make enormous strides in the knowledge of individual kids and in the effect for the whole nation. So it's not a matter of trying to line up everybody and pay them $10 more per point on value-added scores. That's a, that's a silly argument that nobody that I know of thinks is the, the right argument. The idea is, can we use external information about achievement to help us make decisions? 
Eric, mm -hmm. so we, can we open it up? Yeah, to I want to make one final please. statement, and that is, if we're really interested in students' achievement and kids' achievement, I don't think there's any substitute for paying attention to their achievement. Thank you. We didn't have a system for collecting the questions. Uh, has anybody uh, written down the questions? Please raise your hands and we'll collect them. Um, but uh, we didn't set up the panel to have a point counterpoint, but we seem to have uh, emerged at that point. Mark, did you have a, a quick comment, uh, response to Professor Hanushek's comments? Well, I, I agree that uh, I think picking out the best and the worst probably is something you can do, even with the blood instruments of, of achievement tests we have. But, but naming 6,000 teachers and giving estimates for them is not that. So I, I want to make clear that the, the issue I'm talking about is in fact the naming and shaming that, that I think we saw uh, going on there. And I, I agree with, uh, with Rick that uh, we could pick the best and the worst pretty well, and I think we should if we can. Do you want to respond? Yeah, although even in picking the best and the worst, I, would, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't sleep soundly if that were only based on the value of its score. Because, the, because of the bias, potential for bias. But, but nobody yeah. believes in using just value Okay, scores. good. Then, <laughs> then we agree on that. That's good. I think some people do believe that it could be used on its own. One good. Let me... Uh, let me... Uh, uh, okay, we have a question here um, from... Um, somebody from the Graduate School of Education, there seems to be a disconnect between value-added methodology and the kind of teacher performance assessment that is now required at the pre-service level for a teaching credential. Is anyone working on extension of performance assessment to the in-service level? And uh, maybe the educators could explain the difference between pre-service and in-service. I, I agree. I don't, I don't know that anyone's connecting up... Um, like measures of pre-service to, uh, to these sort of outcomes. I haven't seen that. I, I think that one of the problems there is that our, our longitudinal data systems haven't really been around that long that you could do it. And I'm not sure that we should anyway, because re really as a teacher, when they come, first come out, should we be judging them straight away or should they be given a chance to, uh, to become mature teachers? I, I believe that takes a few years. Can I elaborate on my question? Oh, I might have misunderstood. The point was that the pre service credential candidates, you don't have test scores that you can attribute to them. Oh, teachers. absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at what they actually do in and around teaching. Why aren't we doing more of that in a systematic way within service teachers? Mm -hmm. and, and sorry, question, sorry. Hang on. Well, it's related to that work with PACs, and, and he's talking about PACs, and I'm talking about best. And well, now we're getting into the acronyms. <laughs> yes, <sorry. laughs> That's a good sign. That means there are Eric, some a quick comment. I've been there. lost here. Yeah. There's, um, there's an increased pressure on schools of education to show that they're producing good teachers. There's no doubt about that. The studies that are available now of effectiveness in the classroom suggests that credentials are essentially uncorrelated with performance in the classroom. And given that, um, it is questionable whether you want to push them harder. And I, okay, let's go to the next question. Uh, even Dr. Hanushek seems to call for dealing only with the teachers at the very bottom, but wouldn't administrators know who is at the very bottom without value-added score? <laughs> That's from a public school parent. Yeah. So I personally think that everybody in the school, including the janitor, knows who's at the very bottom of the scale. What, in my view, the LA Times publishing rankings like this does is try to propel people to think about how you and develop systems that treat the very bottom. It's not that, I don't think anybody from the LA Times, Jason has a chance next time to, to speak about this, I don't think anybody thought that you should take their numbers and go out and fire the bottom quartile. Um, on the other hand, 
We don't have systems now. The best we have are rubber rooms um, in various cities where we warehouse bad teachers because we have no system to deal with how do we get ineffective teachers out of the classroom. And I think that uh, this is a method of, in fact, pushing people to think of more rational ways. You would never do it by the LA Times story. Okay. I, I do think... I do think that there is, uh, there is some grounds for believing that generally in schools people do know who's doing well and who isn't. I'm not sure it's always true though. Uh, I think that uh, things like value-added analyses can help with that, that sort of information. There are places where people use other systems as well, where there are observation systems. Uh, there, there are systems in the UK and in places like Australia where experts come in and observe. Uh, there are other ways, and, and I think the important thing is that you want to be able to put these different sources of information together and not just rely on one. I wouldn't like to have relied on the principal when I was a teacher, but I wouldn't also like to rely just on some scores, on some tests that maybe I thought weren't very good tests. I, I would like to see some possibility of a range across those. I think we owe it to people to fi try and find them in order to be fair to them. There's an important issue here. The question here, I am concerned that the emphasis on teacher evaluation overshadows a more essential question about the quality of instruction and how teachers are and can and should be supported to learn and improve. This is a very difficult problem, especially since we need too many teachers to just select the best and the brightest or most highly educated citizen. It also requires a much greater social commitment um, to try to solve and just evaluating. Uh, you know, I'm going to take that as a comment. Does anybody want to comment on that? We'll be getting to those issues in the, the later panel, but yeah. Um, looks like we've got another comment. Um, it's a question here. A bad teacher can mean many things. What do you believe to be the most damaging characteristic? <laughs> Attitude or ability? Well, let, let me just add, you know, that I think one of the issues in value added um, that it's not totally clear what aspects of, of teachers' effectiveness that it's actually measuring. And uh, well, so I, I'm wondering whether you could just speak to that. I mean, li literally, it's, it's, the, it's, it's an attitude aspect to it because it's the attitude of the students to want to do well in the test. And if the teacher isn't bringing that about, then there could be all sorts of mismeasurement between what they're really doing and what you're finding out. So, so attitude really does matter a great deal, I think. I, I believe that the most important teachers I had taught me to want to learn, and you know, uh, that was actually the thing I got out of my best teachers. So I thought that was about attitude or ability of the teacher, not the, the kids. Um, well, I think the, um, the, the teacher that. to engage the students enough that they want yeah. to learn is what you mean. That's yeah. what I mean. So the, the reason why people have turned to value-added modeling is fairly simple, but it relates to, to uh, Sophia's uh, equations up there. Essentially, researchers have found no correlates of effectiveness in the classroom or no simple correlates. So that there's extensive research that shows, for example, that having a master's degree provides, on average, no information about the effectiveness of the teacher. Having a teacher who has three or four years of experience versus 20 or 24 years of experience gives no information. The first couple years of, of teaching does have information there. Past that, there are essentially no individual factors. What that means is, to me, in my interpretation, that I'll put in the equation terms, is that teaching is much, much more complicated and much more complex than our analytical methods. And that, it, and that we do not have the ability to predict very well who's going to be a good teacher or we don't know the characteristics that if we just pump up this certain set of characteristics, we will turn teacher X into a super teacher. We just don't have that. And that's why, why value-added modeling in general 
has an interest in the research dimension because it shows huge differences in effectiveness, but they're not correlated with any simple characteristics or measures. But, yeah. but the characteristics you're referring to are the ones that you would find in data sets typically, like number of years of experience or qualification, but there must be characteristics that are not so easily measurable, but maybe an expert could judge, like um, the, the ability to, to the, of the teacher to respond to students and different, you know, of different levels of ability or whatever, things like that, that would be predictive. So this, is, this has been the holy grail of educational research since yeah. basically Jim Coleman in the mid-1960s had the first study of achievement. And the holy grail of all researchers has been through observational means, through data sets that collect various survey information for whatever, to find correlates of effective teaching. And it's just failed. It's, it's, I know that it won't, won't be found, that the, the one thing won't be found in my lifetime, but I'm kind of old. <laughs> I'm going to ask one last question based on a question I got here. I've got several other questions. I'm going to save these for the next panel. Several of them are speak specifically to the LA Times uh, story. I think this panel was to look at some of the issues more generally. The uh, question is, what are the barriers to devising a more comprehensive model? I think you talked to some of those, but what is, where do we stand right now? Mark Wilson, you are on, on another panel that's going to be issuing a report. I mean, is there a move among statisticians and educators to reach some consensus on value added? Because obviously the administration is pushing to link uh, test scores with teacher evaluation. So, so where are we in terms of reaching a consensus on this nationally? I'm not sure we're, we're very close at all. I, I don't believe the NRC is putting together another panel uh, on this topic. I, I hope they will soon. Um, one of the ways I see forward in this is that we need to understand better uh, how teacher practice actually makes a difference in the classroom. Looking at uh, demographic background variables about teachers, I don't think is the right thing. I, I, I believe teachers vary much more subtly than that. that they, but there are teachers who make a difference in the classroom. I, I agree with Rick about that. I think that's, that's strongly the case. Um, and there are efforts to measure teacher practice that are going on um, in several places. There are some in California. I, I'm actually working with some people in Michigan on this topic. And I believe these can make a difference. They certainly, uh, at this point, we're still developing them. We can only at this point say how they work well with professional judgment. We don't yet have them in place enough to be able to do the sort of value-added modelling that, that Rick would like us to do. But I believe we have a, a way forward there. Um, On that note, oh, do you want to make a quick comment? Well, I'm very uh, dubious that we will ever find up, uh, come up with a model that can allow us to compare teachers across vastly different settings. I think we would have to concentrate on this type of neighborhood or this type of student population and rank the teachers within that, but I think we will never be able to rank them across vastly different settings. So what's wrong with that? And why, because why we cannot you... control for, for classes. No, no, but why, do you, why try? Well, LA, I mean, Times, I LA Times has one ranking for the entire um, LA USD. I thought we'd reached the consensus with Mark, but now that's fallen apart. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. But I'm that's sorry. A, good, yes. a good segue to, okay. to our thank next you. panel. I wanted to really thank um, the panelists for a really illuminating.